Hi, my name is Adam Ray. I started making my friends laugh when I was in the, I'd say fourth and fifth grade. You know, I'd prank my teacher by putting like whoopee cushions on his chair, impersonating the teacher when he was gone to friends, getting kicked out, starting, I mean, using the classroom as an audience basically. Um, and, uh, and then I started impersonating this girl named uh, Annie Bernhard. This is when I think really understood that I had something that not every kid was doing or going out of their way to do. And I would impersonate this girl to friends at school and then we prank called a kid that she was, I guess, dating that I liked, but I was a fat kid, so she had a crush on him because he didn't wear the same bra as her. And, uh, and, uh, and my buddies were just crying laughing that I was pranking him and sounding like her and pretending. And, uh, and that's when it all started. No. And then I went to Los Angeles, uh, went to acting school at USC, and, uh, and I started doing a few open mics before that before I went to LA because I was like, I want to be in LA and have done it a few times so that I don't feel incredibly uh, intimidated to, to begin there. But then I really did start in LA because I didn't do stand up at all through college except for a couple frat parties and once in London when I was studying abroad. And, and then uh, I graduated in 05, pedal to the metal in the acting biz. Um, you know, YouTube comes out, doing a lot of sketches, uh, working for Funny or Die, doing videos and working at a casting office, playing Wolverine at Universal Studios just trying to get my foot in every uh, pocket of, of uh, you know, the business to where I could just kind of flex the muscle on all fronts and, and just do as much as possible. Cause there's no rule book or recipe for it. You just gotta do and meet people and get experiences and, and just start honing all the things that you're trying to uh, be successful at. And, uh, and uh, then I got, in a relationship that went south. She ended up fucking a camera guy in Reno. <laughs> we broke up. Classic story. Pixar is doing a movie on it next summer. And then um, stand up, I went in full, uh, full on and, uh, you know, committing to the lifestyle that it requires. You know, driving eight minutes to Santa Barbara, which is two hours north of LA, to do a, a 10 minute spot. Going to San Diego and coming back in the same night, which is two hours south of LA just really making it a priority, which is what you have to do. You gotta give yourself over to it, sacrifice social life, relationships, um, at first, because you have to have no excuse to not be uh, available to do a shit spot or to go hang out somewhere, to meet people, to, you just gotta be available for, the, uh, for that world. And, um, and so then uh, got asked by Bobby Lee to go on the road with him in 2000, I think 10, and uh, quit Universal Studios and, uh, and then started to get some TV and movie shit and then started headlining and uh, now it's been almost 15 years and uh, now it's a drug, you know, just can't not, uh, can't not do it. Obviously out here in Brisbane with some time uh, to kill and was just like, I gotta get on stage and uh, so yeah. For me, it's the live aspect. It's, you know, I did a lot of theater in high school and college and that's honestly why I think I jumped into stand up. I had that, you know, the, the knack to make people laugh and it, and I really enjoyed it. I think I found that out again when I was a kid that, that uh, how good I could make people feel from doing something that didn't not necessarily come super easily, but I, I, I like doing it. It made me feel good to make people laugh and then you're making people laugh. So it's like, a, like this is an incredible thing that why wouldn't I wanna keep chasing that? And, uh, and then once you start to see people doing it professionally, Eddie Murphy, Chappelle, Chris Farley, Sandler, Jim Carrey, Robin Williams, all these guys I looked up to, still look up to, you start realizing that it's a thing you can do and then it's just uh, go time. But yeah, getting that live, you just can't replace it. That's why movies and TV rule and are synonymous with stand-up as far as trying to build your name and your brand, but uh, you just can't replace being on stage and not even just getting the immediate response for like a new bit, which is a thrill in and of itself, but just the uncertainty of not knowing, you know, you get to a point where you're comfortable. I trust myself to be able to handle any situation. Even tonight, there was a guy that was a little, a little too chatty and a little combative, but every time I engaged with him, got laughs, included him, killed it with kindness, slammed him when I needed to. And I enjoy that, you know, it's a part of the whole experience. And, uh, and, uh, I just really, uh, it's something that you can't explain other than to just be it and feel the, the feeling of, of true uncertainty. 
and not knowing how something's gonna go. And that's an irreplaceable experience that, uh, that I feel lucky to get to do, you know. First gig was at Giggles Comedy Club in uh, Seattle, Washington, which is, uh, was a big club in the 90s and uh, everybody used to go there. And uh, Gaffigan, Seinfeld, Geraldo, the top band. I mean, it was just, it was the spot in Seattle. And then it got turned into Jiggles, the strip club. And then went it back, then it went back to Giggles and now it's Laughs Comedy Spot. Um, but uh, that was the first spot, I think it was 2001, before I went to LA and brought a bunch of friends down and uh, had a guitar, did some songs. I believe too that I ran the light by two minutes and the owner at the time, Terry Taylor, who was doing the box office and the concessions and hosting, which was too much. He pulled the plug on me and I said, fuck it. And I dropped the mic and went acapella and finished my set. And I thought I was never gonna get asked back, but I brought like 20 people and the audience had like 22 people in it. So I think he was like, it was a weird move for him to do that. It was my first time I brought people, but he was still like, you're over by two minutes, get the fuck off the stage. But um, that was the first gig. So that's, and you know, Seattle is a great comedy scene and, uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully they can get back to uh, normalcy soon, you know? The night I bombed really bad. I was doing a show called Mo Better Mondays at the uh, Hollywood Improv. It's a uh, all black show and uh, D-Ray Davis was hosting it. And I've known D-Ray for a minute. Uh, and I thought we were real cool. I think we are cool but he fucked up my name when I went on stage. I followed a guy that just destroyed. And those rooms are great if you get them and terrifyingly awful if you don't. And you gotta do it pretty quick. <clears throat> They're giving you benefit of the doubt. They want you to be great. And I did a couple things up top that I think were just like, I didn't read the room right. And I was in a hole and then kept digging a hole and then try to do some crowd work. That didn't go well. And then, uh, and then I started, what did I do? I started, I think it, when I got the big laugh, it was truly uh, just recognizing what you gotta do, how bad it was. I think I just said something like, well, this is, you know, this is actually a big deal, the show tonight, because uh, this will be my last show. I'm quitting comedy. Uh, and I want to thank you guys for making that possible. And just that got like a big thing and everyone just basically recognized and acknowledged and, and enjoyed that I was acknowledging that this was not a set to remember. Well, you know, uh, Eddie Murphy is the first standup I saw that made me think that this was something I could do, uh, th that made me realize it was something you could do. I didn't see Eddie Murphy and go, yeah, it's fucking easy, but it was, inspiring because it looks so fun. And I was like, oh, I like to do that. I like to do voices and tell stories. And, and so, um, and he was just so good. And again, it was seeing somebody make so many people happy at one time was just, I was like, well, that's what I want to do. Um, Jim Carrey, obviously, um, stand-ups, once I got into it, um, Chappelle is the goat, obviously, and he's just always been my favorite comic, um, especially because he's, been so consistent for so long and evolved and become uh, such an empower, empowering voice for people and the country on uh, uh, many levels, just aside from being silly and funny. He's thoughtful, he's present. I got to go out to his uh, summer camp in Ohio in August and kick it with him and it was awesome. He, he was just, he's, he's the goat on and off stage, takes care of so many people, very present and attentive. And it makes sense that he's, uh, you know, able to speak with so much sincerity and humor and, and have a message always in what he's talking about, whether it's, uh, um, you know, something he meant to do or not. He's just captivating and engaging. And I've seen him at the comedy store do three hours at one in the morning or 20 minutes at, uh, at, at the, you know, the farm in Ohio. But um, Bill Burr is another guy that I've loved for a long time. Just could not be more locked into his point of view. I feel like he just knows who he is so much and anything he says, his, his uh, opinion on it is usually something that I agree with and relate to. And, and if I don't, he's great at making you understand why it's funny. Um, Jim Gaffigan, great joke writer. Greg Giraldo was one of my favorites. David Cross, uh, Harlan Williams is a guy I really learned crowd work from. And uh, Mark Norman right now is a great joke writer. Really love Mark. 
And uh, Beth Selling is a great joke writer. Melissa Villasenor is a good friend of mine. We started together. She's just all the right amount of silly. And uh, yeah. I've been lucky to do a lot of cool shit. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, playing in the NBA Celebrity All-Star Game in Charlotte two years ago was, I don't think I'll ever top that. Um, and uh, right place, right time. My boy Adam Devine took me to the NBA Awards. Was a little drunk after the show at the after party. Met Adam Silver, the commissioner. Shot the shit. Invited me to Summer League in Vegas. Went with Brad Williams. Brad made a joke about not letting Peter Dinklage play before him. He was like, you guys, can, you're in. Then I was like, Brad's just a prop. I actually play. We're a package deal. Cut to us in the game. Best weekend of my life. But, uh, and again, just, you know, stand up, all that stuff is the, the culprit for that because Adam and I met at the improv, became buds. I started opening for him. Career highlight that, that was mind-blowing was I was with Adam Devine. We were on this Australian tour, and we were uh, in Melbourne, and we uh, we had a night to kill. And I look up, I go, hey, uh, Weezer and Foo Fighters are playing at um, the stadium in Melbourne. And uh, I was like, oh, shit, well, let's try to go. And he's like, I know the tour manager. He's Blink-182's manager. I did a music video for them. We go backstage. We get VIP. We're just hanging out after the show, kicking it. We do a three-and-a-half-hour show. We're smoking, drinking. Kroll is just a man. The whole Foo Fighters group is just... They're legends. And uh, and then we're like, well, we'll see you. And then we're like, what are you guys doing tomorrow? And they're like, we have a day off. We're like, well, we that's when our show is. So then they came to our show. And we show up in their backstage. They see the show. We go out after uh, and kick it. And I'm a huge Foo Fighters fan. I'm a huge Dave Grohl fan. I obviously was in Seattle when Nirvana was... I was a little on the younger side, but still, like, you couldn't deny what was happening and, and ignore... You could not figure out that it was special even at like nine and ten but uh but getting to hang with a legend like that see him do his thing i think here's what was really special about it see him in his element and then he got to see me in mine and and look at me with an extra set of uh goggles that was just like cool like game recognizes game almost you know and that was really cool and uh yeah i'll never forget that yeah i think the obvious answer is things just have gotten Society has just gotten uh, more sensitive, but um, I, I don't feel like it's, you know, I'm not ever someone who's truly pushing the envelope and trying to isolate the audience with anything political or too edgy, but I don't feel like my voice has been stifled uh, much. Um, comedy, I think during my career, I mean, it's changed just because uh, you know, with YouTube and social media and more ways to be seen. That's definitely what's changed during my career. Uh, and then comedy itself just evolves always. Every four years, five years, I think there's, you know, I think it's almost like schooling where every four years I feel like you should be taking another uh, step in, in growing as a person and a performer because I feel like those two things are also uh, tightly linked because, you know, the more you figure out who you are as a person, that you're going to benefit from that on stage. And you learn about that on stage, and then that translates and, and bleeds into your life. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it just is always uh, getting... I think comedy is always... People are always looking for ways to reinvent either themselves or the art form, push the envelope, do something that hasn't been done. Um, but, yeah, again, the obvious answer is the... Uh, the social media and uh, exposure element that I think a lot of people, you know, and it's been said a, a million times, but it used to be Johnny Carson and, uh, and that was it. And so now that there's that late night shows aren't even the, the gatekeeper anymore and it's all uh, in the hands of the comic is uh, pretty cool. My advice for anyone starting comedy, stop making excuses about how you don't have you're waiting for that perfect set to get on stage. That's the main thing I, f I feel like I hear from young comics is, I'm just waiting for I get that right set or I'm still writing. Oh, cool, like write, writing a lot before you get up is good, but you're truly starting from scratch. So there's as much as you practice in the mirror or whatever, which I think you know, whatever you need to do to, to, to be as comfy as you can and give yourself the best chance to win on stage the first handful of times, do that but you don't learn it all. It's truly the most just profession where you can't replace the work, getting the reps, getting the experience. You have to get on stage. 
and, and to try to start finding out who you are on stage only happens from doing it and, and, and bombing and failing and trying something and doing this and doing this that you think is funny. And if the audience does it, figuring out why that didn't hit and uh, going up the next night and, and taking any show that comes your way and not feeling like you're too big for a... Uh, I mean, out here, there's certain shows I've hopped on that were not as conducive for laughs as I would have liked. And I talked to some younger comics that were like, yeah, I'm gonna do, go do this shit gig and I might not do it. And I'm like, I mean, are you really at a point to where you should be, you can turn down gigs and, and not get the, the rep? Because there's been shows I've done where as, even as bad as it's, it's been or as, as uh, not you know, fulfilling as it felt, there's always something to learn from every rep, you know? Whether it's a new bit that, that crushed or you bailed on something, you, you immediately walk away, you know what you, what you could have done better, I think, if you're really honed in on it. I get off stage and I'm not thinking of what was great, I'm thinking of like, fuck, missed that, uh, didn't, you know, uh, you know, probably rushed that bit a little bit, didn't uh, commit fully on that thing like I wanted to, certain lines I could have said in engaging with the crowd I'll think of like oh man just to and that's not like I'm prepping or planning like oh cool if that happens again I'll say this it's just like a keeping the, the wheels turning and trying to stay sharp because I feel like the more you're thinking about uh, you know how you can improve then once you get up there you can just kind of relax and play you know I have a crowd work uh, album coming out in December just an all crowd work uh, album uh, called I'll Take It From Here. And uh, yeah, pretty pumped about that. Um, obviously I do that a lot in my uh, act. So it's, uh, I've got a lot of great uh, sets from two different gigs that I've combined for one uh, album. And then uh, the show uh, on NBC called Young Rock comes out I believe in February. Uh, season two of this cartoon I'm on called Crossing Swords uh, on Hulu comes out uh, in June. And uh, got a cartoon on Apple TV right now called Doug Unplugs. And uh, the podcast about last night. And then tour dates, all at adamraycomedy.com. Uh, clubs are starting to open up in the uh, States again, so trying to get that going. And then, uh, and then you know, probably uh, go smoke some weed in the, in the back alley again with tobacco in it so I can fucking <laughs> ruin my lungs before I go back to COVID. <laughs>